Hello, my name is uh, Jean-Luc Tifo, and I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of Madison in Wisconsin. Uh, today on Socratic Studios, we'll be covering my work on the mathematics of burger flipping and the optimization of cooking times. Welcome, Dr. Tifo. It's such an honor to have you on the podcast with us. We're really glad that you could make it today. Thank you. So before we begin, could you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to do this research? Clearly, this isn't really your conventional research question. Yeah. I mean, I'm an applied mathematician uh, trained as a physicist. And uh, one thing I love to do in my work is modeling. Modeling is sort of the art of taking some physical problem and, and couching it in a mathematical framework, but in particular, in a kind of simple mathematical framework that we can then solve. Um, and so I'm always on the lookout for interesting little problems around everyday life um, that has some interesting behavior, right? Whether it's bubbles in a soda can or, you know, the rings left around a wine glass when you let it sit. All these, all these problems often have some interesting fluid dynamics or thermodynamics behind them. And I, I love to study that sort of thing. I love the challenge of writing down an equation and then seeing whether I can get the equation the solutions to this equation to match the observed behavior and often just as a, at a qualitative level, right? We're not always looking to get an exact answer because an exact answer often requires a supercomputer, right? And that, to me, that sort of takes the fun out of it a little bit if you have to resort to the big computers. So a long time ago, there was a friend of mine uh, called Percy Diaconis, who's a professor at Stanford and his wife, uh, Susan Holmes, who's also a professor at Stanford. And they wanted to study the cooking of potatoes. Um, basically, Percy is very well known for his work on card shuffling. He's the guy that proved that you have to shuffle a deck of cards seven times for it to be truly random. And so they were interested in cooking, applying this kind of shuffling approach to, you know, when you have a pan full of potatoes and you're kind of flipping them randomly, right? Well, what's the best strategy for this? Is there sort of a better way of of picking a strategy for flipping the potatoes to make sure that they're on average with high probability kind of well cooked. And so they dragged me into this because they needed somebody to make a model for the actual cooking part of this. They were doing the probabilistic part, but I, I was in charge of the cooking. And as often happens in these projects, we never really finished it, but I got interested in the cooking part by myself. And I started realizing, well, there's an interesting question just as to cooking one potato, right? Like one slice of potato that you put on the pan and you're flipping it. And then eventually I stumbled upon this quote by Kenji Lopez Alt, who's a very famous uh, food writer. And that's this article, that the, the statement that's quoted in my paper where he said, well, you know, clearly if you wanted to cook a, a burger as fast as possible, you'd kind of want to flip it as often as possible. And then because if you imagine flipping the burger more and more rapidly, you're exposing it on average to the hot surface for a longer time. And they claim that you could get as much as 30% increase in the cooking time by doing it that way. And presumably faster cooking is better because you don't have as much time to get rid of moisture. So you get a more moist food, whether it's a burger or, or a slice of potato slice or uh, a slice of eggplant on the grill. And so the challenge was to recreate a mathematical model that would exhibit this acceleration of cooking and also turn into this idea that, well, maybe you can optimize it in the sense that what are the best moments at which to flip this? Oh, okay. So that's very interesting. So um, are would you say that um, mainly these are questions of pure intellectual curiosity or um, are you also pursuing some utility uh, as well? So... That's a very good question. My, my main research is in fluid dynamics, but in particular, what's called mixing in fluids. So mixing is what you think it is, right? In some sense, if you put cream in your coffee and you stir, that's a mixing problem. And the question is, how fast does the cream homogenize in your coffee cup? And that's not the most interesting question, or at least it's not very challenging because the cream goes very fast, right? So there's not much of a question in there, but there are many mixing problems where um, we need to know that number. We need to know how rapidly something will mix. 
So combustion in car engines, for instance, involves the mixture of about 700 chemicals that all react together very rapidly. And so the strategy about how you're going to introduce these chemicals in the kind of reaction chamber is very important. Um, mixing is important for global warming, for instance, because the carbon dioxide, you know, we would be very happy if it got into the ocean, for instance. Well, that makes the ocean more acid, but at least it helps us fight the temperature rise. So the question is, how quickly does carbon dioxide get into the ocean? You know, what do you think the process is? Actually, that's it's wave breaking, right? The way the way carbon dioxide gets gets into the ocean is every day and every night there are waves breaking in the ocean, and when they break, they trap some air, and that air gets dissolved into the ocean. So, trying to quantify this mixing process of how much air actually gets transported into the ocean over time is is a, a huge challenge, and it's a very important number about how much CO two we can actually get into the ocean. Um, and and the burger one is more closely related to these cooling problems that I've been interested in. So let's say you have a microprocessor is generating lots of heat, but you have liquid cooling. What are the best strategies from the fluid dynamics perspective to remove the heat as fast as possible from the microprocessor? And a lot of these fluid flows that you want have some kind of overturning idea because you want to come near the hot side but then bring the heat near some cool side such that it'll radiate away. And you want to do this as rapidly as possible. But if you're doing this very rapidly, it starts a lot look, to look like the burger flipping solution, right? It starts a lot like you're flipping some object on a grill and there's a hot side and a cold side. So in a way, the burger flipping problem was a little bit, to me, it was a little bit of a joke project, right? I'm not going to lie and tell you that this is like the heart of my research. But when you have some mathematical tools that allow you to answer some question, why wouldn't you look into answering it, right? It's, it was an intriguing question for me. And also the mathematics used is rather elegant and simple to, and, and approachable. And I think the, the, the paper also has some nice pedagogical value in that way. So um, d diving into the specifics of your research, could you give us an overview of the um, thermodynamical processes that are needed as background information to understand your research? Yeah, so there's one big equation that underpins everything, and it's called the heat equation in physics. Um, and it's basically what it sounds. It's a partial differential equation, which is sort of like, to me, it's the height of calculus in a way, right? Because it's an equation that relates derivatives with each other, so time derivatives and space derivatives. And it's an equation that tells you something about how fast a distribution of heat, so maybe you have a hot middle, or well, you have a cool middle for the burger, and you have hot bottom, etc. Uh, the heat equation tells you how that heat is going to evolve with time. And uh, it's a very old and well-studied equation, but if you make the surrounding dynamics complicated enough, there's still something interesting to look at in this equation. And in fact, this equation applies to things not just like heat, right? So anything that has some probabilistic aspect to it. So Something very close to the heat equation is also used to model stock market fluctuations, for instance, because the price of a stock has some same some of the same property as a random process involving heat conduction. Of course, there's a couple more modifications to the equation in this sense, but the heat equation just underpins um, you know, a huge amount of different processes that we're interested in. I use it. I use it in my work all the time, but I use it for different things. I use it for modeling microorganism. I use it for modeling heat conduction. Um, so I, it's, it's one of my favorite equations. And so the, the challenge in the problem is to solve the heat equation for this burger, which is you know, for the, uh, what we modeled as a kind of one dimensional slab of food. Um, so that in itself is not very hard. But what I did to make it a bit harder is I did put some realistic rules about what it should do near the boundary. For instance, this is a metal plate on the bottom and it's air on the top. And you have to be careful about how you model that. And then there's the flipping which introduces this extra dynamics into the equation, which ma makes it much more challenging to solve. And then finally, on top of all that, there's the optimization, meaning even if I can solve this problem, now I have to turn, turn some knobs and decide what is the fastest way of doing this. So it's a hierarchy in some sense of complexity uh, throughout the paper. All right. Um, and so I just wanted to ask, is there some sort of, uh, I guess not a rigorous one, but 
an intuitive derivation of this heat equation that um, the listeners can appreciate? Perhaps, I mean, roughly speaking, maybe the, the strongest thing that embodies is this idea that heat flows from hot to cold, right? That's called the second law of thermodynamics. And it is pretty damn important because if you didn't have that law, we would be able to build perpetual motion machines. So we're, we're pretty certain that this holds, that if you have a hot side and you have a cold side, the heat always goes from the hot side. Maybe more precisely for the heat equation, it tends to smooth out any imperfections. So the heat equation takes some initial concentration of heat, say, and it tends to smooth it out and make it uniform. In fact, that's why Photoshop, the, the software program, actually uses the equation for image blurring, right? So if I ask you to take an image and make it a little bit blurry, all that Photoshop does in some sense, or one of the plugins for Photoshop, right? Not every single method, but is to imagine that your photograph is heat and it lets it flow a little bit according to the heat equation. And that makes your old equation blurry because you're now, your, your photograph has been, has been forced to follow the second law of thermodynamics and everything gets more uncertain. And in fact, you build up entropy into the equation. In fact, you can run what's called the reverse heat equation, which is a little bit more tricky for image sharpening. And that's exactly what Photoshop does. It runs a backward in time version of the heat equation, which sharpens the edges in your equation because it runs against the second law of thermodynamics now. I mean, in a fictional way, right? Because it's not actually heat. So the heat equation is also used in image processing all the time. That's very fascinating. So diving into the specifics of your research now, what are some of the assumptions that your mathematical was model was based on and why did you make those assumptions? So, you know, I kept everything super simple. I read up on a little bit in the food literature. The food scientists, of course, you know, know how to solve this problem to some degree, right? But they usually do it using pretty large computers, in fact. Um, you know, I mean, the professional you know, the universities have departments of food science often, and these people know what they're doing. They know how to simulate heat conduction, but they do more than heat conduction. They also model uh, the fat content. Uh, they often model how to cook the food from frozen, in which case there's a moving frozen line throughout the food. So things can get horrendously complicated because as the fat content changes in meat, the, the heat conduction also changes. And of course, moisture is terribly important to model as well. So again, as a modeler, if you tell me everything you want to put in, I'm eventually going to say, well, this is no longer a problem that's, you know, that I can, that I can say anything about using simple equations. So I tend to throw out as much complexity as possible and keep only the essential. And so I just model my food as a sort of like as a solid slab of food of, of, of a solid, ignoring anything like moisture content and things like that. And, and this is not unreasonable only in the sense that once you've solved the simplest problem, then what you do is you solve the next most complicated problem and so on and so on. Instead of solving the most complicated problem at, as a first cut, which sometimes is done, especially in biology, I think it's a better idea to solve a hierarchy of problems. You start with the very simplest problem, you look at the answer. Then you solve the second most complicated problems. Let's say you had moisture to your food then you look, has the answer changed much? If it has, then that means moisture was really crucial. If it hasn't, then you've learned that moisture is actually not so important to modeling the whole thing, et cetera, et cetera. So I just keep adding complexity until I'm kind of sure that I'm representing reality in, in, in some essential way. And so in this case, I stopped very early. I, I, I spent most of my energy, I have a very simple model for the interior, and I tried to be as realistic as possible in modeling the boundary conditions, which are what you have to specify about the heating and the cooling. Now the heating is metal, which is very simple to model. A metal surface is one of the simplest things to model in, in heat problems. But the top when you're grilling is air. And what does air do? It convects, air moves. So the top of the burger is never as hot as you think it is because the air is very good about convecting uh, heat away. There's something I always tell my students in my in my applied math class that, you know, if you just look at the conduction properties of air, it takes about three months to heat up a room, a typical size room in a building, which makes no sense, right? Because space heaters would be useless. And the reason why 
it's much faster than this is because of air motion, right? It's not just conduction when you consider when you consider the heat in the room, the air in the room is also moving and carrying heat along with it. And it's the interplay between motion of air and conduction of air that really allows you to cool a building. And so one has to do a simple model for what is the air doing and taking heat away. And that's all represented in one magic number called the, the heat transfer coefficient. And I basically just went to the literature and kind of looked in the, in the, uh, physics literature, the people measure these coefficients of heat transfers. These are actually rather difficult experiments to do, actually. Um, it's not easy to have a laboratory set up where you control the temperature. In fact, temperature loves to leak out from everywhere. It loves to be non-uniform. So, you know, when you say that something is at 20 degrees Celsius, that often only applies to the center, not to the edges, etc., etc. So any experiment involving heat is actually quite complex to run. So I just make the simplest assumption. I see. So um, you went into this uh, a bit in your previous answer, but um, could you talk a little bit more about the the methods you used to calculate how long it took the burger to cook and your findings? Yeah. So that was actually one of the most interesting thing because to me anyways, because when I first wrote down this model, I was like, oh, clearly something is cooked if the temperature is above a cooking temperature, right? So for meat, I don't know, um, 160 degrees or something like that. So, you know, depending on how you like your meat, right? And so I, I figured, oh, that's very simple, right? Like you just put a greater than sign in your program and you say, if this exceeds a certain temperature, then it's cooked. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because I was demanding that the whole thing be cooked at once, which it should be. But just because something it cooked doesn't mean that the temperature hasn't been lowered somewhere else. Like when you flip a burger, the temperature on top immediately goes beneath the cooking temperature, right? Because it's now exposed to air and there's no heating anymore. But that doesn't mean it uncooks, right? <laughs> the temperature can go below the cooking temperature, but as long as it was above the cooking temperature for a while, then the thing is cooked. So, in fact, in, in some sense, the biggest difficulty in the whole project was modeling the proper function to determine whether something has been cooked. What you have to do is you have to follow every single point in the food and you have to track the temperature over time. And if that temperature ever exceeds the cooked temperature, then you declare that point to be cooked. And you don't stop until every point is cooked, basically. So that was a little bit tricky. And also there's a lot of room for improvement here, right? Because as many people have pointed out, I mean, when you post a paper, people are more than happy to point out the flaws in your paper. Um, and so some people are going, well, that's not how cooking works, right? Because maybe you want to not leave certain parts cooked too long, right? In the sense that you don't want to burn the food either. So I did not account for that. In the, in the current model, all that matters is that you exceed the cooking temperature at some point. But in a more refined model, I would also probably put something like force as a constraint in my optimization problem that no part of the food be exposed to the heat for too long, right? So, but in a way, going for the fastest cooking takes care of this problem to some degree, right? Because you might expect that the fastest cooking solution is also the one where the food, you know, is exposed to the least heat possible. So it might be the least burning solution, but I haven't checked that. And that, that, that'll be an interesting follow-up project, actually. Absolutely. And so when I was reading your paper, I noticed about the model specifically that the dimensions you chose for the burger were fascinating, that you had it as about one centimeter thick and yet infinite in extent. So could you expand on why you chose those dimensions? Yeah, this is very common in, in modeling. This is called the slab model, um, you know, because the idea being, so this is my little post-it notes, right? So when one dimension is thinner than the other, right? And you're heating the whole thing relatively uniformly. I agree with you that something different will happen near the edges, right? In the sense that the heat distribution will definitely be quite different near the edges. So I'm making some mistakes in that modeling assumption. And in fact, the food scientists, and the, they often model the full three-dimensional burger patty. But in the middle, things are relatively uniform in thickness, and there's no edges. 
So you would expect the temperature to be governed as this one one dimensional process. It's, it's a very common simplification. But in addition, if you're cooking something, you're probably not worried about the edges. Those are going to cook very easily in some sense. So the real cooking problem is in the center. So that was another rationale in the modeling assumptions that, well, maybe a one dimensional problem wouldn't do so bad, right? Because at the end of the day, yes, the edges are going to do something different, but that something different is almost certainly going to be faster. So if I manage to cook as fast as possible in the middle, I will have done the best that I can in avoiding for the edges to burn, for instance. Again, I'm never 100% sure about any of these assumptions, but often you just appeal to some reasonability argument, right? Just say, well, that seems reasonable to me. I agree that doesn't sound like math, but you know that's the physics part of the project, right? It's the physical assumptions. The mathematical parts are, given this model, what is the best solution to this model, right? But the physics and modeling part of the problem is, is to try to make some reasonable assumptions about what you expect to happen. So when you're doing uh, any sort of modeling problem, how do you build the intuition as to what are the best assumptions to make? Because I feel like that could be uh, a difficult intuition to come by. Yeah. I mean, like many things, you know, probably the biggest thing at first is just a lot of experience, right? You have to have looked at a lot of models, right? And you, you learn over time what are the building blocks of a good model. And the way we build a model, at least in this, in this framework, right, for these heat conduction and fluid dynamics, is almost in some sense additive in the sense that we, we have an equation and we just keep adding terms that give us different types of behavior. Like maybe you have a heat source, so you add a term that gives you some heat source. Maybe you have a term that leads to chemical decay or radiative, radio, um, radioactive decay, which means over time, things are going to disappear because they decay. That would be some kind of a thing we call a sink or a decay term in an equation. Maybe you're modeling microorganisms and they reproduce. So you need a term that somehow increases their number. For more like COVID, for instance, right? You will have you will have a growth growth term that has to do with the infectivity, the so-called R parameter, right? So you would have a term that would indicate growth of this, but you would also have some kind of term that maybe acknowledges the fact that they die out in some other way, right? And so you you kind of have a toolbox of almost Legos. Each each piece of Lego is a different term that could lead to a certain kind of behavior, and you add them together to make some reasonable equation. Usually. It's many equations, right? But all of these equations are made out of building blocks. Uh, chemical reactions are also very fun to model that way. Um, um, traffic flow is also the kind of, a kind of problem that we can look at, right? Like what is the density of cars on the road? It turns out there's some really fascinating behavior there. And so that's in some sense the first step is to think of some good, what would you, what are the important effects and how would you put them in as an equation, right? And you've got a toolbox of things. And then I would say that the second phase, in a way, is, is a kind of almost a sanity check, right? Like if you're modeling the concentration of COVID, like how many COVID particles are in the air, and your model suddenly tells you there's a negative concentration of COVID, well, that can't make sense, right? You've The model somehow became invalid in some way. So that happens all the time, that there's some range of expectation for reasonable behavior of the model. And if you leave that range of expectation, it must be that you've left the domain of applicability of the model and you need to either modify the model or temper your expectations a bit what you, about what you can expect the model to tell you. So I would say that, that those are the steps in a way, right? Some experience in knowing what kind of terms to put in. You construct the model by putting these terms together and then you do a sanity check on the kind of results you get. I see. So going forward, if you had the opportunity to make a more advanced model about your problem and had, for example, more resources like time, manpower, etc., what major changes would you like to implement other than accounting for burning like you previously mentioned? Yeah, burning, moisture, um, fat, right? Uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, actually, you know, to me, that that's not the most interesting direction in the sense that, you know, I'd be more than happy if somebody wants to make the model more complicated. But personally, because I'm a, you know, I'm an applied mathematician, I like to solve things almost exactly, right? My model contains lots of things which are 
what we often often call pseudo-analytic solutions, means things that are almost pen and paper, but with a little bit of input from the computer, as opposed to something that you put on a big computer, right? So a lot of the complications it would immediately require a pretty big computer in the sense that it's it's a different ball game. So my interest would be more maybe to think of a slightly different problem. Like a lot of people have told me, well, what about spit roasting, right? What if you're rotating the rotisserie chicken, right? <laughs> Is the uniform rotation the best thing to do, right? I don't, that's not obvious to me that what you want to do is uniformly rotate the thing, right? Maybe there's a better solution than uniform rotation. So that might be a cute one to look into, right? It's, it's actually a very similar problem. I, I can already think of how I would make this mathematically. Clearly, I can't make the infinite slab model, but now I can make a spherical, you know, I can make a, a a, a, a cylinder of food instead, and it'll be rotating and I can specify the rate and I have to tell you that it's being heated somehow from below, right? So I, I can probably reuse a lot of my same software that I wrote for optimization of my first project to tell you about what would be the optimization of spit roasting. So I, I, I think that would be a wonderful project to give to a, say an upper level undergrad or a beginning graduate student. Often we give graduate students a kind of you know a, what we call a warm-up problem by which we mean a problem that can be solved in like a year right so it's not <laughs> it's not necessarily that easy but a phd is like five years right so so it's, the students gets introduced to solving a problem first and and then we'll then we'll give them a, a more complicated problem so i think many of the complications of the burger problem uh, would be interesting little you know warm-up problems and of course that's without talking about the mathematical aspects of it the, the the burger flipping problem actually raises some interesting mathematical questions, which are kind of a little thorny to explain, but something about to, having to do with what's called the spectrum of an operator. And I'm quite curious is what, if one could prove some rigorous uh, facts about uh, these operators. Usually what, which direction I'll go will probably depend on what kind of things my students are interested in. I see. So... At, at, at this point in the podcast, we wanted to ask some more lighthearted questions. So um, to begin with, what is your ideal burger? <laughs> you know, as a French Canadian, I guess we're closer to the French and that we like our food usually a little bit more rare than in the US, right? So I, I kind of like a pretty rare burger. Um, some of my, especially French and French Canadian friends were a bit appalled at the temperatures that I quoted in the paper for a cooked burger because it is a very well cooked burger in the, the paper that I quoted, partly because the numbers didn't really matter too much to me, right? I was just trying to pick one representative case, um, but you know, I actually like my food quite a bit less cooked than uh, m maybe the model in the paper applies better to chicken, right? Because chicken, you can't mess around with the internal temperature of a cooked chicken, whereas beef is a lot more, there's a lot more wiggle room. Um, so yeah, I like it pretty rare. <laughs> Very nice. So do you have any amusing anecdotes that occurred along the course of your research that you would like to share? Well, maybe it's not an anecdote, but um, sometimes I, I worry a little bit about my, about my career because I also did some research on taffy pulling, right? Which is a very interesting mathematical problem. You might have seen taffy. It's this candy that you stretch and fold. And uh, so that got some news coverage. And so for a while, I was the taffy guy. Um, and then I did some research on hagfish slime. So the hagfish is this fish that secretes this slime and, and the slime does crazy things. It turns water in, into gel. And so that also got some media attention. So for a while I was the hagfish guy, but now my colleagues are all calling me the burger guy, right? So I've got to be a bit careful that I don't get pigeonholed as the, as, as the, the, the guy in our department that's always working on the weird food problems or the weird slime problems. So I'm trying, I. I'm, I'm not sure how comfortable I am to be known as the burger guy all the time. <laughs> I like to think that my research goes a little bit beyond the burger flipping uh, aspect. Absolutely. And so in your opinion, do you feel like the industry would benefit from having a lot more of these more lighthearted problems that are less about the actual problem itself and more about the spirit of mathematical modeling or in other contexts? Yeah, probably, right? I mean, I think that, you know, many people are aware of this, that it's it's often a bad idea 
to throw everything you have at a problem, right? I alluded to this earlier, but the problem is if you if you if you get a, a big computer simulation and and you run the the sort of most realistic case that you can, and people do this especially in biology, right? They they want to simulate cells and things like that. And cells are very complicated things. I don't blame them, but they, they put in everything. And the problem when you put in everything is that you, you, you it's very hard to isolate what's important, right? You have you have a million parameters, or okay, even if you have ten parameters, it's already too many, right? How how do you vary parameters in a way to see the change when you have ten parameters? You know, that's imagine the number of possibilities, right? If I want to try ten values for each of the ten parameters, that's ten to the ten possibilities, right? That's one followed by ten zeros. You can imagine that nobody has time to look at the output. And that's not even that ambitious, right? Looking at 10 values of parameters, that's not the end of the world. But the problem is that there are 10 parameters. What happens when you do simple models, if you can solve the problem in this sort of somewhat analytic way, so somewhat pen and paper, you know, whiteboard level, the parameters appear as part of the solution. Like maybe there's a parameter called A and you get E to the A or you get A squared. So you don't need to vary that parameter to find what happens because you can see the so-called functional dependence that this parameter appears in. Whereas numerically, you would have to discover that this A appears at e to the A or A squared, right? And that can be very difficult to, to find from the numerical solution. So the big advantage, I think, of simplifying the problem and starting very simple is that you get solutions which tell you a lot more about what happens if you vary the parameters. And that's kind of all we want to understand, right? We don't want to solve just one problem. We, we almost never want to solve just one problem. We want to understand what happens if I modify the parameters in my problem. What happens if I modify the temperature a little bit? What happens if I change the material, right? And if all of that is buried inside of a computer simulation, it's extremely difficult to explore the probability space or the, the, the parameter space in order to, to find the interesting behavior. Whereas when you have one of these exact solutions, that can only be reached if you simplify the problem, then the parameters up stare you in the face, right? Yeah. So I think it's worth spending time to solve these simple problems first, because then armed with this knowledge about how the parametric dependence uh, occurs, that will guide you in making a more complicated problem. Right? And it's often the case, unfortunately, that making the more complicated problem requires less skill, right? Because I don't want to, I don't want to belittle computer simulations. I think a lot of people show a lot of art in how they do their computer simulations. But some people don't. And it's easy to just add parameters, add parameters, add parameters, because hey, it's a computer. It's just, you know. And then you look at the solution, and you don't really know which parameter were important that you added, right? You have no idea. And and to me, that's what's lacking when you when you go to the computer too quickly. Yeah, it's like, like breaking the black box on... I've been told that a lot of AI research is um, it's it's often hard to understand what's going on underneath the hood. So um, building a little bit of intimacy with the the underlying mathematics is important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a very good point, right? With AI, I'm sure, it, of course, AI is important in many, many, many applications. But scientifically, we have to be careful, right? Because what is the goal of science? Is it to reproduce the real world? I don't think that's the goal of science, right? The goal of science is to understand the real world. Just being able to reproduce it is a first step, right? It, it's useful, but then we need to ask more questions. And having some very, having a machine learning code that has been trained on some data and can somehow reproduce, you know, what happens in this particle physics collision, et cetera, that could be useful, I don't know, but it's not It's not the end of research, right? It is not the goal of research. We're not trying to reproduce stuff. Maybe we are if we're talking about machine learning as applied to, you know, a engineering application. Maybe the only goal is to optimize some manufacturing process. I can understand. But if we're talking about science, I think we also need to ask questions about what, why does this work, right? That's kind of what we want to know. Um, and so... I hope there's always going to be room for people like me who, who don't necessarily do these machine learning and AI approaches to solving problems. We instead 
use much more traditional techniques, but try to think of the building blocks, you know, individually and, and put them together to get something interesting. So as an applied mathematician, do you see this reductionist philosophy being um, utilized a lot in your field? Or is it oh, something absolutely. that you believe should be more? No, no, absolutely. In, in fact, we don't need to go very far. Sometimes the reductionist philosophy is imposed upon us. If you take what's called the Navier-Stokes equation, which is the dominant equation of fluid dynamics, it's the equation that gives us turbulence. We're still trying to prove even the most basic facts about that equation, right? You might have heard that there's this famous $1 million prize for proving the existence and uniqueness of solutions for that equation. Um, and that's still an open prize, right? Nobody has collected the million dollars, um, but people have tried very, very hard. And the point is that is just the most basic of all equations in the sense that it's complicated, but it's not that complicated. And so the point is that nobody would dream of adding too much complexity to this equation because, you know, as, as far as mathematicians go, I mean, because we can't even do the basic, you know, stuff about this equation. So it's deeply humbling to work with these equations because the limit of our understanding is, is so shallow that, um, you know, you, you're, you're forced to use these simple models because otherwise there's nothing you can do. Do you think um, your bottom-up approach when trying to understand these models could be used to tackle more complex systems? Like uh, looking at the most fundamental model and then building up from there into a more complex one? I think so, but you have to divide complexity into two things, right? As I just mentioned, the Navier-Stokes equation itself is relatively simple, but its solutions contain the weather, right? So even having a simple equation is something that can be used to study deeply complex systems. So complexity can either come from the fact that I'm putting everything in. In biology, for instance, complexity often emerges because there are so many interacting actors, right? Cells are interacting with each other all over the place. But in fluid dynamics, often it's just that the, the base equation is actually rather simple, whereas the biologists don't have an equation at all, right? But we have, we're lucky, we often have an equation. And even with having this equation, the behavior is still incredibly complex, right? There have been tens of thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of papers written about this Navier-Stokes equation. And we still have, you know, we still have conferences about trying to solve even the most basic things. And I'm solving here is, a little bit qualified by what I mean by solving this equation, but this idea of proving existence and uniqueness has turned out to be one of the great mathematical challenges. So the complexity doesn't necessarily have to come from me putting it in by hand. It can often emerge from the equation. And I personally find that more interesting, right? I find that almost the heart of applied math, that the complexity should not come from the fact that I chose to make everything complex at the start. It's just that things become complex because of nonlinearity, because of chaos, because of all sorts of exciting mathematical phenomena. So do you believe that there exists uh, some kind of like a happy medium between having models that are so complicated that they become unfeasible to answer and then models that are very reductionist and have only a few variables? Yes, I think so. I think there's often a happy medium. Um, with one small caveat is often it has to do also with the tools that we use. So for instance, a model might be complicated, but if I look at it, I can often find what I call a, a chink in its armor, right? Like f what we dream of in physics and applied mathematics is what's called small parameters. If you have some equation that's complicated, but then somewhere there's a parameter that appears, and that parameter is kind of small for some reason. That actually is one of the most powerful tools of all of applied mathematics because we can exploit that small parameter to get approximate solutions. And, and small can also mean large because one over large is small. So we, we often, the way we do applied mathematics, the way we find um, solutions that, are, that expose the behavior of the problem is often by looking for a small or a large parameter. In the burger flicking, flipping problem, for instance, I look at the limit where you flip very rapidly, right? And then the, the period becomes very small. And I exploited that small parameter to get some um, exact solutions that I would not have been able to get otherwise. 
Now, that's not really physically that relevant because it's flipping too fast, but it shows you at least what would happen if you went to that limit, right? What is the tendency? And actually, that's why I was able to show using that, that the best cooking improvement you could get was 30%. It would involve, which match exactly Kenji Lopez Alt's uh, estimate, which is, I think, just luck, by the way. I don't think that actually means anything. It's not a deep thing that we got the same number. But the point is that looking at this unrealistic limit where you you're, you're some magical chef that manages to flip their burger at every microsecond, that seems unrealistic, except that it now tells me what's the best I could possibly do, right? And if the best I can possibly do is, 20, is 30%, and I somehow have a way of achieving 25%, that tells me that I've kind of won, right? Because there isn't much more to be gained from doing anything else. So putting bounds on the problem is another technique that we use. Instead of solving a system directly, we try to limit the range of behavior of a system. And often that's almost as good as actually solving the whole system. So Sanjim and I came into this conversation uh, thinking that we were going to talk like solely about burger flipping, but instead we had a discourse about the nature of mathematics. And we also had um, some interesting points about, uh, or we had some uh, epistemological questions as well. Um, so I was wondering, looking towards the future, are there any similar questions that are seemingly lighthearted, but will actually um, reveal more about, or reveal more fundamental truths when they're explored that, uh, that you would like to investigate in the future? Absolutely. Um, one of my colleagues here, Severo Spagnoli, runs a little laboratory where we often have undergrads doing small experiments. And uh, he's doing uh, interesting experiments now. We, we like to think about bubbly fluids like um, sparkling water or champagne because those behave quite differently from normal fluids. And right now, he's got an experiment on so-called dancing raisins. So, and this is an experiment I encourage you to try. If you have a glass of fizzy water, just put some raisins in it and watch what happens. You'll see that the raisins will start rising and sinking, rising and sinking, rising and sinking, and tumbling and doing all sorts of fun stuff. And it's quite, it's quite obvious what happens, right? The air bubbles nucleate at the raisin and they make it lighter to the point where it eventually rises because it's light enough. But when it gets to the top, it dumps all of its bubbles and becomes heavy again. So it sinks, but you get these really fun, you know, patterns, etc. So the question is what model can you write to describe this? That's always the question in a way, right? So I see this fun little effect and I go, what, what could we write? So, you know, he and I have both written parts of a model that tries to get at the most essential description of this system. So we'd like to reproduce, for instance, a simple question would be, can we reproduce the behavior, right? Can we reproduce the periodic nature of this or can we reproduce the tumbling, etc.? cetera? Um, so that's, that's one example of a small problem that, that I'd like to understand. I've also got one involving, um, there's a classic math paper called, can you hear the shape of a drum? Which is really a mathematical question, but in practice what it would mean is that if I give you a, a drum like just a drum in the sense of hitting it. Can I listen to the drum and tell you what shape it is? Right? Is it actually, is, is there enough information in the sound produced that by the drum to tell you what shape it actually is? Assuming exact information, right, of course. And so this was a classic paper. So there was a paper called Can One Hear the Shape of a Drum? And then there was another paper later called One Cannot Hear the Shape of a Drum, where they proved they showed basically two drums that had different shapes, but the same sound. So that proves that you cannot hear the shape of a drum, right? And so in talking with friends, with colleagues the other day, we were talking about some variation of this problem. And I think we have some ideas about how we could make this problem a bit more, um, maybe a little bit more complicated, like in the sense that, is there other ways to get information about the the drum 
maybe by hitting it in several places at once or something like this. Um, if, if I gave you more ways of probing the drum, of generating sound with the drum, could there be a point where I could actually hear its shape now, where I would have enough information to hear its shape? And so we're, we're, we're kind of curious about that, whether we could generate a kind of generalization of this problem. So that's a, that is almost like a complete intellectual question. But it might actually have some applications because the, the implications of this are, are, involve a field called harmonic analysis, which is really present in many parts of serious mathematics, but also in real, real world applications. So there is, there is some, there's some intriguing possibilities here about what could happen. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Thifo, thank you so much for appearing on our podcast. It was really an honor to have you here and have these discussions with you about mathematical models. And good luck with your future work in fluid dynamics as well as applied mathematics. I can tell you the next time that I'm putting a patty onto the grill, I'll have your mathematical model next to me. Thank you so much. It was a lovely time.